Move More for Your Mental Health is the theme for Mental Health Awareness Week 2024, which takes place this year between the 13th and 19th of May. We know that there is an intrinsic link between physical well-being and mental health. You may have experienced it as runner's high, that feeling of euphoria following a yoga practice, or the sensation that all of your problems have seemingly disappeared when you take a walk in nature. If you've ever wondered how it all works and what you can do to extract the same benefit, then keep watching until the end. Because in this video, I'm gonna break down the role of hormones alongside the clinical evidence that supports why you should move more for your mental health. Hormones play a big role in our well-being. We have feel-good hormones such as endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, which regulate the reward pathway, intimacy, and tolerance to pain. We also have hormones that help us cope with stressful situations, such as adrenaline, cortisol, and norepinephrine, which raise our blood sugar and heart rate in preparation for fight or flight. All of this is controlled by a complex network of glands known as the endocrine system and helps us to maintain homeostasis, which is the body's way of maintaining an internal balance while navigating the challenges of everyday life. To achieve this, it uses a process called allostasis to regulate our internal environment via gradual adaptations to stress. In the short term, this brings with it useful behavioral and physiological adaptations to a changing environment. In the workplace, you might refer to this as resilience. However, excessive amounts of allostatic load induced by chronic exposure to stressful stimuli combined with unhelpful coping strategies results in a diminished capacity to adapt to stress. We become more vulnerable to changes in our environment, leaving us more susceptible to diseases that affect our cardiovascular health and immune system, as well as changes in mood, emotion, and thoughts that affect our behavior, also known as poor mental health. And that is significant for a few reasons. Chief among them is that 63% of respondents to the CIPD's latest health and wellbeing at work survey said that mental ill health was the leading cause of long-term sickness absence lasting four weeks or longer. And according to the health and safety executive, the nation loses 17.1 million working days every year due to stress, depression, and anxiety. If persistent exposure to stressful situations is associated with high rates of absence from the workplace and an increased likelihood of adverse mental and physical health outcomes, what evidence is there that moving more will increase our resilience, reduce vulnerability, and improve our mental health? Well, in my quest for answers, I came across a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Published in 2015 and authored by Dr. Bessel van der Kock, one of the world's foremost experts in traumatic stress, The Body Keeps the Score draws on 30 years of experience and makes the case for a new paradigm of treatment. Moving away from standard talking and drug therapies that fix symptoms and toward alternative approaches that address the cause while healing mind, body and brain in the process. Chapter four talks about self-regulation and the options available to control our stress response to better manage our emotions. Top-down regulation involves strengthening the capacity of the prefrontal cortex to monitor your body's sensations and can be helped by practicing mindfulness, talking therapies, and meditation. On the other hand, bottom-up regulation involves recalibrating the autonomic nervous system through a combination of breath, movement, and touch. And on that note, chapter 16 talks about the reintegrative benefits of yoga, specifically in relation to its effects on heart rate variability, which is the relative balance between the two branches of our autonomic nervous system. For example, when we inhale, we stimulate our sympathetic nervous system, which results in an increase in heart rate. On the other hand, when we exhale, we stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which slows the heart rate down. In healthy individuals, inhalations and exhalations produce steady, rhythmical fluctuations in heart rate. Hence, good heart rate variability is a basic measure of well-being. However, individuals with a poorly modulated autonomic nervous system, such as trauma survivors or those of us under persistent and higher amounts of allostatic load, are easily thrown off balance both mentally and physically because they are more vulnerable to changes in their environment. And since the autonomic nervous system is responsible for how stress is handled in both body and brain, poor heart rate variability or lack of fluctuation in heart rate in response to breathing has negative effects on thinking and feeling as well as how the body responds to stress. Thus, the chapter goes on to highlight the results of studies that confirm that changing the way that you breathe, such as in the practice of yoga, has been proven to reduce anxiety, lower the secretion of stress hormones, and improve heart rate variability. More recently, a systematic review and network meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials designed to identify the optimal dose and modality of exercise for treating major depressive symptoms were published in the British Medical Journal. To put this in context, major depressive disorder is a leading cause of disability worldwide and is thought to lower life satisfaction more than debt or divorce. It also exacerbates comorbidities such as heart disease, anxiety, and cancer. Clinical practice guidelines in the UK, US, and Australia all recommend physical activity as part of treatment for depression. However, what they do not provide is clear and consistent recommendations about the amount and type of exercise. 218 unique studies involving over 14,000 participants were selected for review. 
Exercise was indeed shown to have moderate effects on depression, either alone or in combination with established treatments such as cognitive behavioral therapy. Also, the benefits of exercise tended to be proportional to the intensity prescribed, with vigorous activity being better. Although the review stops short of highlighting any single mechanism that explains all of the findings, it hypothesizes that the decrease in depressive symptoms in relation to exercise can be attributed in part to a combination of social interaction, mindfulness, increased self-efficacy, and immersion in green spaces that combine to generate positive outcomes. The data shows that each of these factors are associated with a decrease in depressive symptoms. However, there is no single treatment that covers them all. Case in point, running may satisfy many of the aforementioned factors. At the same time, it's unlikely to directly promote the mindful self-awareness provided by yoga and Qigong, both of which, by the way, are often practiced in groups and feature social interaction, but seldom have fast and objective feedback loops that improve self-efficacy as we see in strength training. Also of note here is that the level of autonomy granted served as a predictor of effects, but in the opposite direction. That is to say that more autonomy was associated with weaker effects of exercise on depressive symptoms. The review states that one possible explanation for this is that people with depression benefit from the clear direction and accountability of a standardized prescription. When provided with more freedom, the low self-motivation that is symptomatic of depression may stop patients from setting an appropriate level of challenge. For example, they may be less likely to choose vigorous exercise and extract less of a benefit as a result. Lastly, this review also highlighted evidence that exercise increases the effects of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And so offering exercise as a treatment may act as an adjuvant for those already taking antidepressants. There's a link in the description if you'd like to check out The Body Keeps the Score or the review we just spoke about in more detail. And if you got value from this video, make sure you hit that subscribe button and join us as we continue to produce content that helps business leaders, managers, and employees have more accessible conversations about mental health, well-being, and inclusion in the workplace and beyond.